Gran Turismo, Need for Speed, and yes, Mario Kart. These aren't just some of the best-selling racing video games of all time, they're some of the best-selling games, period. Today, driving games are one of the staple genres of the video game industry, an economic goliath with twice the revenue of the film and music industries combined. The evolution of automotive racing games mirrors that of automobiles themselves. Just like cars, the early history of racing games is one of innovation. And just like cars, racing games have a colorful history of gimmicks and classics, hits and flops. In the early days of racing games, you could drive any car you wanted as long as it was a white blob on a black screen. In 2020, game developers are racing up the far slope of the uncanny valley, creating driving experiences nearly indistinguishable from the real thing. Within the world of video games, it's often been the racing genre that pushes graphics and physics further than ever before. So, how do we get from dots on a screen to the present day photorealistic racing sims? Who are the innovators and the dreamers of racing games? Who is the Porsche of pixels? the Ayrton of the arcade, the Giorgetto Giugiaro of graphics. After all, video games are the only chance most of us will ever get to drive an Indy car, a Ferrari Testarossa, or a crazy taxi. So blow the dust off your cartridges, grab your plastic cup of tokens, and hit start to join the race. It's the history of racing games today on Past Gas. Past Gas Podcast. It's about cars, it's not about ports. Hell yeah. Womp, 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 womp. <laughs> Hell yeah. We, wah, 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 wah. Yep. Cool. Real, I can tell you guys are really excited for today's episode. I was, I was trying, I was like, I was like, oh man, I should make like an iconic noise from a game. And then my brain just <laughs> blanked. And then I was like, I know, I know a Mario sound. I know it's not, this all happened in that second. And I was like, then I tried to do like, I was like, but how do you do the quink, quink, quink when you go in uh, the, yeah. in the pipe? And then I just ended up doing, uh, <laughs> The baseline from when you're under <laughs> ground in Mario. Bom, 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 bom. I am one of your hosts, uh, Nolan Sykes, joined as always by my co hosts, Joe Weber. Word up. And James Pumphrey. I'm not a businessman. I'm a business man. <laughs> <laughs> toot, toot. <laughs> toot, toot. Chugga, chugga, loot, loot. Yeah, so today we are talking racing games. This is part one of three episodes we're going to be doing on the subject. Uh, very excited to dive into this. Um, we were inspired to do this series uh, because uh, Dirt 5 is coming out very soon. And, and guess who's in it? Yeah, James and I are in that in that game. Yeah. So Yeah, almost uh, all the hosts from Past Gas are in it. <laughs> almost all the hosts of Past Gas, yeah. This is not sponsored by Dirt 5. We were just inspired to do it because of the game. And in celebration of racing games and over in, in general, because uh, I think racing games are a huge part of why I'm into cars in the first place, especially like the PS2 era of games, which we'll yep. get into next episode. That was like that was me growing up playing Gran Turismo or Midnight Club 3 uh, gave me a huge just like encyclopedia of car knowledge, I think, in my young brain. So I think a lot of you guys listening can probably relate. And I'm just excited to do this topic. Guys, what are, you, what are your experiences with racing games growing up? I mean, I've said it a million times. You know, I think a lot of people in our generation, and yeah, I think Nolan and I are in the same generation. Joe and I definitely are. But uh, we got into one of the big reasons that we're in the cars is games. You know, like playing, like Gran Turismo was the first time I saw Skyline. Right. You know, I was like, why is that Maxima so fast? I think I realized, like, I, I like Miatas now, but I had this like negative stigma with Miatas for a while because that's the first car that you get in Gran Turismo 3, right? Uh, maybe. You get a choice between a couple cars and one of them's a Miata. And I was like, man, why do I have to race this slow car for a long time until I get enough money until I can get, you know, the cars that I really want. And so for a while I was like, oh, Miata is not a great car, but now I love them. <laughs> well, yeah, because like, that's kind of the one thing, uh, especially in the older video games, is like they weren't they, they were groundbreaking, of course, for their time. But like going back and playing them, you're like, this does not capture the feeling of driving one of these cars for real. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're like the cars is staying in the center of the screen and all the stuff <laughs> is moving around it. But I remember going to my friend Nathan Steinke's house and I was like an intent a Nintendo kid. Like I had an N64 and I went to Nathan's house and he had a PlayStation and uh 
Gran Turismo and I played it and I traded my N64 for a PlayStation. Oh, hell yeah. And you did those like those 12 hour races, the endurance races. Yeah. Oh, man. I never did one of those. I think we uh, could talk about all of them. Wow. All right. Well, uh, we're not going to be talking about Gran Turismo this episode. We will get into it in more depth next episode. Today, we're going to be talking about the, the birth of the racing genre and um, pretty much from the 70s to the mid 90s. A uh, lot of interesting games, a lot of weird games, but a lot of them that were very in, uh, influential and I think still are relevant today, kind of in the in the zeitgeist, at least. You'll know what I mean when we get there. We'll talk about it more. Anyway, uh, let's, let's get into it. Cars were a part of the long and dusty evolution of wheeled transport, from the cart to the covered wagon. Virtual cars, on the other hand, just kind of popped into existence. One day they weren't there, and then the next, they were. The Big Bang moment of racing games came in 1973 with Atari's release of a game called Grand Track 10, widely considered to be the first ever car racing video game. Grand Track was designed by Larry Emmons. It was an upright arcade cabinet weighing a whopping 400 pounds with a steering wheel, gas and brake pedals, and a gear shifter with three gears. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So, I mean, right out the gate, it was already like approaching like a proto sim almost. A PS4 is six pounds, just for reference. In the game, white dots on the screen outline an overhead view of the track. And that was track singular. There was only one of them in the game. And your car was represented by a little hashtag looking symbol. Yeah. So you had a little hashtag thing that was supposed to be your car. Basically, imagine Pac-Man racing around a go-kart track and you're not too far off for what this game is. I think it's uh, it's always like fun and nostalgic to remember video games from this time, but then you actually play it and it's like this is not fun at all. Why? Yeah, this sucks. <laughs> I was like so psyched about it. <laughs> I wonder like what the gear shift did. Uh, like, I did you redline? I think it does <laughs> limit like your speed, you know. I remember watching footage of this for like a wheelhouse that we did on video game cars like two years ago, and that was how you played it. It did look very boring, I gotta say. <laughs> uh, it is very, it's always a treat when you do play an older video game, no matter the genre, and it does hold up still, and it's still fun to play. That's when you know it's like a truly great game. Yeah. Yeah. One Thanksgiving, my nephew and I played uh, Cruise in USA mm -hmm. for like a whole week. That's fun. that game. That game still slaps. Yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> Atari had actually wanted to make a driving game since the company's creation a year earlier in 1972, but they decided to go a different direction for their first ever commercial video game, a little game known as Pong. Bloop. Unlike Pong, Bloop. Grand Track was a bit of a dud Bloop. when it hit the market, mostly due to the complicated and frequently malfunctioning circuitry required to connect its various moving parts, so uh, it wasn't very reliable. And, like, the only way to play these games was to go to actual places where they had all the games, arcades. And can you just imagine, like, waiting in line to play Pong? And then, now, I mean, just now thinking about it in, like, COVID times, everyone just, like, getting their grubby, greasy oh, hands Oh, so on. grubby. <laughs> it's so gross. Atari and their contemporaries in those early days were clearly still honing in on what players might want in a racing game. For example... One feature in Grand Track that was scrapped before being released was a small printer to print off high scores. Cool. <laughs> uh, can't imagine why that didn't make the cut. The lack of cohesion around the game actually contributed to Atari losing half a million dollars, nearly putting the company out of business. Luckily, Pong came in and became a huge hit, and the rest is history. Grand Track's slow start didn't discourage other video game developers from entering the race to make a successful racing game. Much like in the world of real-life automobiles, a trans-Pacific rivalry emerged, with American companies like Atari competing with the Japanese. Given that the two countries were also competing to manufacture the electronics and hardware on which these games would be played, it made sense that they'd compete to make the games as well. The first Japanese driving game was called Speed Race by Taito. The title was distributed in the United States by Midway Games under the title Wheels. Taito had an interesting background in Japan as an importer and distributor of the country's ubiquitous vending machines. It was also the first company to distill and market vodka within Japan. Basically, drinking and driving was Taito's thing, just not at the same time. 
The company would later become famous from 1978's Space Invaders, a game which ushered Ooh. in the golden age of the arcade, which we will get to later. Love that, Space Invaders. That's still fun. Speed Race was, like Grand Track, an upright cabinet with a steering wheel, gear shifter, and gas pedal. But unlike its predecessor, the gameplay of Speed Race actually somewhat resembled real life. It still had a bird eyes perspective, but instead of a static map, the course scrolled vertically downward, giving the sensation of forward motion as you weaved your car through oncoming traffic. Meanwhile, as was standard practice for arcade cabinets at the time, Atari relaunched Grand Track 10 under various editions, including Grand Track 20, which was two player and a smaller version called Track 20 as well. In 1976, Atari also released a clone of its own game called Le Mans, which featured six tracks based on Le Mans, the Nürburgring, Sebring, Laguna Seca, Silverstone, and Daytona. That's cool. Yeah. It's like, like the that. first one where they actually have real tracks. I believe so. By 1976, arcade giant Sega were ready to make their own <laughs> entry into the burgeoning racing game market. The game, called Motocross, was a motobike racer, uh, notable for its early version of 3D first person as objects on the horizon appeared to be smaller in size. It was also the first game of any genre to use haptic feedback as the handlebars would vibrate when your bike collided with another vehicle. Just like Grand Track, Motocross was repeatedly rebranded. One iteration was called Man TT after the legendary Isle of Man TT that we've already covered in past gas. But maybe the coolest iteration was Fonz, named for Henry Winkler's character from Happy Days. A promotion for Fonz aimed at arcade owners boasted TV's hottest name, <laughs> your hottest game. Oh, oh yeah. Hey. <laughs> hey, forget, sit on it, sit on the egg, Potsy. <laughs> hey, Potsy, what's up, Richie? Hey, what you gonna get? Hey. Richie, why don't you go direct some beautiful movies, hey? Yeah, hey, why don't you go make, uh, like, uh, go make, like, a Palm 13 or something. <laughs> <laughs> hey! Hey! Uh, the promotion also went on to brag that, quote, Sega has made it possible for those 42 million Fonzie fans <laughs> to spend a quarter and become, and literally become, their motorcycle hero in an action-packed race. Fonzie is also notable for supposedly being the first ever licensed video game for the goddamn Fonz. That's <laughs> right, baby. Um, it was also the only game where you could play as Henry Winkler uh, that we know of. That's cr okay. No, let's. Sorry. The first licensed video game and the first actor to appear in a video game. It wasn't like Steve McQueen and Bullet. <laughs> no. no. It no. wasn't ja it wasn't like Sean Connery, James Bond or anything like that. <laughs> it was the freaking Fonz and Henry Winkler. <laughs> I hope it sold a billion copies and made Henry yeah. Winkler very rich. I hope he got his royalties for sure. Like the automobile industry, the arcade business was highly competitive and prone to a mix of innovation and copycats. Take, for example, three incredibly similar games, all released in 1976, all featuring very similar gameplay. Bally slash Midway's Midnight Racer, Micronetics Night Racer, <laughs> and Atari's Night Driver. They all featured a brand new innovation, and all three claimed, or at least implied, that they had originated it. That first was first person. In other words, it was a game that let you see the world from the driver's seat, inside the car, looking out. That's the only way to play for me. I can't do any other way. I'm really bad at third person. Got to do first person. But if I'm driving, I gotta be. I gotta have a wheel in front of. Me. I gotta just if see I, the wheel. If I, you know? dude, I don't even. I don't even <laughs> want to play a game with that without a wheel. If I'm racing, I like the the inside the car view. Uh -huh. If I'm drifting, I feel it's easier to be third person outside the car. Yeah, I feel like a Forza. I'll play like with a controller. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Same. Same. Yeah. Even if I'm like using a controller for like Forza on like a track, it's still easier for me to see those like those curbs and those apexes coming if I'm in first person. But like, yeah, like a game like Grand Theft Auto. Yeah. Third person. Take it or leave it. Yeah. In the words of Micronetics, their game Night Racer for the first time 
gives you the experience and real sensation of a champion drive. The truth was that none of the three night racing games were the first first person racing game. That honor belonged to an obscure German inventor and possible mad scientist, Dr. Reiner Fürst, who had a year prior created a totally unique racing game available only in Europe titled Nürburgring 1, obviously named after the legendary Nürburgring. Never heard of it. <laughs> well, <laughs> Nolan, you should check out our episode of Up to Speed on it. I believe you wrote it. I'll check it out. <laughs> <laughs> Ted Michon, a game developer for Midway, had happened across the Nürburgring game while visiting a bowling alley in Dusseldorf and upon his return to the States, pitched it to Midway. Meanwhile, Dave Shepard, who programmed Night Driver, had never played the game. He had seen a photo of the cabinet <laughs> in a flyer. <laughs> it, it's easy to think of this as plagiarism, but remember that in the early days of coding and computing, those days were full of stories exactly like this. Just like cars... It was a gray area if you wanted to use what had come before you to inspire you. I mean, and also it's like these are all dots on a screen. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah, we'll make a game about spaceships. Great. Cool. Spaceships. Awesome. That can be a dot on a screen. It's like cars. <laughs> yes, cars. That'll be a, a great. Um, in another similarity to the automotive business, video games thrived on buzz and companies would try all sorts of methods to market their games. As we all know, sex sells. But in a close <laughs> second uh, to sex comes violence. Oh, yeah. And that's exactly what 1976's Death Race sought to exploit. The game, built by a company called Exidy, was hugely controversial at the time of its release. And that controversy helped Death Race sell like ponchos at a blue man group show. I.e. <laughs> very well. <laughs> the game was actually a reskinned version of a game that came out a year before called Destruction Derby, in which instead of avoiding cars, as was typical in the vertically scrolling games of the time, you actively tried to hit them. Death Race's innovation was to reskin the cars you were targeting to be gremlins. Okay, they're humanoid figures standing on the track. Its cabinet featured two Grim Reapers driving neon-colored muscle cars through a graveyard. <laughs> That's awesome. While its highly pixelated graphics are hilariously tame by today's standards, the graphics on your TI-83 Plus are more advanced. The game was hugely controversial when released. In fact, it was one of the first explicitly violent video games of any genre. And now we know that video games are so violent that it causes all the problems. So this started... Yeah. <laughs> All the problems. <laughs> Even the New York Times commented on Death Race, saying that for a quarter, a player gets a minute to chase and run down all the symbolic pedestrians it can. Hitting one of the figures rewards the player with an electronic shriek and points scored on a grave marker. A grave marker. <laughs> I don't want to make fun of anyone in New York. We love you guys. You, you talk funny, though. Drawing a contrast with other forms of media, Dr. Gerald Dreisen, a family values advocate, interviewed in the article, complained that, quote, On TV, violence is passive. In this game, a player takes the first step to creating violence. I'm sure most people playing this game do not jump in their car and drive at pedestrians. A one in a thousand? One in a million? I shudder to think what will come next if this is encouraged. It'll be pretty gory. To a certain extent, uh, that guy was right. Um, video games would soon become gorier than everyone could imagine. Uh, but to be clear, there's still absolutely no evidence of a link between video games and violent behavior. I'm so tired of hearing about this. <laughs> it comes up every 10 years, the stupid argument. When I was a kid, it was Grand Theft Auto, which, you know, pretty gory game, pretty outlandish. But, like, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything. People know the difference. People know the difference. Stop thinking kids are stupid. They're smarter than you think. And now people are saying like freaking Fortnite is too violent. Yeah. And Phil Brooks, the designer of Death Race, agreed with you, Nolan. And he said that, that he drove. This is a quote. <laughs> um, a Pantera sports racer, 160 mile per hour street machine. And I never hit anyone. All right. That's probably not the most responsible thing. <laughs> <Yeah. should> say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, he also said that they toned down the game's content, claiming that 
We could have had screeching of tires. We could have had moans and screams for eight bucks extra. But we wouldn't build a game like that, all right? We're human beings, too. <laughs> all right. I have conflicting. We don't even mess with screeching tires, yeah. all right? I'm, I, I have conflicting feelings for Phil Brooks right now. But anyway, so far, all the games we've talked about today are from the 70s. But let's be real. When you think about arcades, you don't think of the 70s. You think about the 80s and that really sad episode of Black Mirror where uh, the old people upload their brains into the cloud so they can live in that John Hughes movie. That's actually, San Junipero is a great episode. One of my favorites. It's great. This decade was the indisputable golden age of the arcade with the release of Super Mario Brothers, Tron, Donkey Kong, and Pac-Man, among countless others. It would also turn out to be the golden age of arcade driving games. That's right, baby. Oh, yeah. The first major entry of this decade was Rally X. I'm going to call it Rally Cross because I, I think that's what it's supposed to be called. A Namco game built to run on the same circuit board as Pac-Man. You could use the same machine. The player drove a blue car around a multi-directional maze, collecting rally flags to progress through the round while being chased by red cars. It sounds totally different from Pac-Man. Actually, it makes sense that they use the same circuit board. Uh, Rally X is impressively unique, though, forcing you to manage your fuel levels and allowing you to kick up smoke screens to spin out the chase cars. Rally X was also notably the first game of any genre to feature continuous music in the background, a pretty big innovation, uh, making it essentially the first ever video game soundtrack. Uh, the song has to be heard to be understood. It's really bad. It is yeah. really bad. Um... <laughs> It's really strange. And it's 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 not like you can't make good music like Zelda. Well, this was like the first eight bit soundtrack, so you know they didn't. Dude, what are you guys talking about? That is a slapper. Nah. Uh, <laughs> it sounds like someone calling a Nokia that has melted in the sun and been crapped on by seagulls. Oh God. That's a good. That's the good part of it. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> not an. I'm. I, it's just, it's going for too much, really. The manager at Namco was like, hey, we can put music on here. And then the composer was like, oh, sh trying to transpose my, my, my first symphony onto a MIDI keyboard. <laughs> anyway, uh, Rally X would sell an impressive 60,000 cabinets despite the song. Although that was nothing but a pellet to its sister game, Pac-Man, which gobbled up over 350,000 units in worldwide sales, making it one of the most iconic arcade games of all time. 1981's Turbo by Sega was arguably <laughs> the racing genre's first foray into gameplay that would be somewhat recognizable by today's gamers. It was a vertical scroller, but unlike the scrollers of the 70s, it was playable in magnificent color. Turbo was a Formula One game where the player raced through various locations and it boasted multiple features that seem basic now but had never been previously included in a game. For one, weather conditions and time of day could be changed in the game, and there were realistic light up oil and temperature gauges on either side of the steering wheel. Very interesting. That's cool. That is cool. Implementing all these features took such a toll on the programmer Steve Hanawa that he was hospitalized for a month after Turbo's completion from a combination of stress and exhaustion. I just spent so long trying to program a little LED light to turn on. <laughs> what the hell? These guys are the killing hospital. them. I mean, for these early games, though, the industry was still very small. So you had very small teams working on this game. And, I mean, if Steve was probably the only person working on Turbo. Yeah, their, their policy was to have one programmer develop a game. Like, one programmer. Unreal. Uh, thankfully, uh, Hanawa, he, uh, he recovered. His game was a hit, with a simplified home version getting released for the ColecoVision console in 1983. Unlike Death Race, Sega skipped the violence and went straight for sex appeal to sell Turbo with glossy promotions featuring beautiful Japanese models, including one where a high-heeled lady's dress seems to be blowing off her body simply by the force of standing next to the arcade cabinet. Just like the automotive industry, game progression was defined by a cycle of innovation and refinement. If Sega's Turbo represented innovation, Namco and Atari's 1982 pole position was pure refinement. The game instantly, quote, made Turbo look stupid, in the words of John Jacobson, a vintage arcade expert, uh, no relation to uh, Jingleheimer Schmidt. Pole position's development took three years and was in part inspired by Namco's 1976 game F1, 
a crazily inventive arcade game where the shadow of a model car spinning around a circular track was projected on screen, creating an illusion that while captivating only loosely replicated the experience of driving. That's pretty neat. This thing looks really cool. Uh, Bridget, can we get a clip? Gotta say, that we gotta cool. put this on screen for our, our viewers. Pole position could recreate the actual F1 experience in a video game. Players raced laps around a uh, replica of Fuji Speedway. And while you'll probably remember that earlier games like Nürburgring 1 and Le Mans featured real life courses from a bird's eye perspective, this was the first game to do so from a more realistic third person perspective. It's the first game we've talked about today that actually looks like it might be kind of fun to play. And I, I've played Pole Position many a time in the arcades. It is still fun. It's got bright colors, moving backgrounds, and a distant Mount Fuji that's at times visible. And it has a real sense of speed. It was also one of the first games to feature product placements. Uh, you had to avoid colliding with billboards featuring brands like Pepsi and Canon cameras. All this was achieved with dual 16-bit processors, a stunning amount of power for the time. Uh, for comparison, a Nintendo NES only had a single 8-bit processor. So, yeah, I mean, pole position, I think we've all played that at some point. This was definitely, like, one of the older games in the the arcades that I would go to. We never, when I was growing up, I don't know about you guys, but there weren't like arcade arcades anymore. Um, most of the arcade games that I would play were either in like pizza shops or places like Boomers or like mini golf places. That's a Boomers yeah. mini golf. Um, like the skating rink or the batting cages. Yeah, yeah all those Becky Yeah, cheese. all those places where it's like, hey, here's a fun thing you can do, but also here's video games for the nerd, for the more, for the less athletically inclined kids out there. Yeah. <laughs> people who can't putt yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's definitely my experience with arcade games but they definitely had pole position in there and i i still think it's 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 decent it holds up okay it's it's fun it's like definitely dated but it's like you still get that exhilarating feeling you still get a little bit of adrenaline yeah this is definitely like the first game in this episode that you could still go back and play it for like 10 minutes and be like all right i get why people liked it Pole Position was so popular, it inspired a Saturday morning cartoon, which had nothing to do with the video game. It was about an American <laughs> family named the Derrits who fought crime undercover while touring with a driving stunt show. What? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> while the cartoon was canceled after one season, I can't imagine why, the game would inspire a new slew of knockoffs and copycats, including Sega's Hang On, a motorcycle version, uh, featuring multiple landscapes and most notable for being the first game to offer a deluxe version that actually let you sit on top of a plastic motorcycle. These are some of my favorite games. I don't think I ever played Hang On, but there are a lot of other motorcycle games like this, which I always enjoyed. I feel like we glossed over the, the pole position show when it's insane that, like, I would have loved to be in the pitch meeting where the, they're like, all right, so everyone knows the Derrits, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. You guys know the Derrits, yeah. the family of uh, like undercover cops? <laughs> <laughs> Hang On was a hit for Sega and inspired its lead designer, Yu Suzuki, to take on a new challenge, creating a game that didn't just imitate pole position, but would outdo it. Suzuki and Sega would achieve just that in 1986 with the release of what would become a cultural touchstone Sega's best-selling arcade game no, of the entire decade. You can't do it the whole time, Nolan. You can't do it the whole it's time. In... And probably the most iconic arcade racing game ever, OutRun. There's oh, yeah. a okay, very go. good chance you've played OutRun, and if you haven't, you've certainly played a game inspired by it. Your goal is to weave through traffic and hit checkpoints as you drive a Ferrari Testarossa convertible through a variety of Mediterranean-inspired backgrounds. Suzuki actually toured Europe. Yu Suzuki went to Europe to scout locations for the game. As you drive, forks in the road allow you to choose which area you want to travel to, eventually leading to five separate endings for those with the skill to finish the game. Like Hang On, the deluxe edition of OutRun featured a car that actually bobbed to the left and the right as you drove. Suzuki's attention to detail is evident everywhere in the game. To recreate the Ferrari, he photographed and even recorded audio of a real-life Testarossa to use as reference for the in-game sound. After inserting your quarters and starting a game, you could adjust a radio dial to choose the music you drove to, which is awesome. Wow. Uh, yeah. A, a progenitor to Grand Theft Auto a couple decades later. 
Outrun's soundtrack was also a major inspiration for the synthwave revival of the 2000s, with the genre actually being referred to as Outrun music. And to top it all off, riding shotgun next to the driver in every game of Outrun is a blonde woman. Uh, talk about wish fulfillment for teenage boys. Yeah, it's the first racing game where you had a girlfriend. Just want to give a big thanks to our sponsor this week, Mint Mobile. Breaking up with your old wireless provider just got a whole lot easier thanks to Mint Mobile. They were the first company to sell premium wireless service online only. And now Mint Mobile is introducing their unlimited data plan for just 30 bucks a month, guys. Let that sink in. Is it sinking in? It's like a lotion of, of, of freedom. An unlimited plan for 30 bucks a month. How much is your soon-to-be X wireless provider charging you? Probably save a lot of money. $30 a month for unlimited? Crazy. These guys are crazy. For people that hate their phone bill like me, and people who are ready to cut ties with big wireless like me, Mint Mobile offers their premium unlimited plan for just 30 bucks a month. My old phone carrier charged $58.83, so I saved nearly $30 a month switching to Mint. Here's how it works, guys. By going online only and eliminating the traditional cost of retail, Mint Mobile is able to pass those significant savings on to you, and I think that's really awesome. All plans come with unlimited talk and text, so you can talk to your parents, call up your mom and see how she's doing, plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5 G network, but it gets even better because you use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and you get to keep your phone number along with all of your existing contacts. So you get to stay in the loop. That's pretty awesome. Pretty tempting if you ask me. And if you're not 100% satisfied, Mint Mobile has you covered with their seven day money back guarantee. You can be like, you know what? I don't really like this. This isn't for me. And they're like, all right, no problem. No pressure, man. Here's your money back. Guys, the time is now break up with big wireless and switch to Mint Mobile's premium unlimited data plan for just 30 bucks a month. To get your new unlimited wireless plan for just 30 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash gas. That's mintmobile.com slash gas. Cut your unlimited wireless bill to just 30 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash gas. Thank you, Mint Mobile. In 1986, the same year as Outrun, a lesser-known game also featuring a European sports car was released for the Commodore 64 and other home computers. This was Turbo Esprit by Durrell Software. And while less flashy and fun than Outrun, home hardware still lagged behind what the arcade could provide. Turbo Esprit featured innovations that would prove to be far ahead of its time. The game put you in the driver's seat of a Lotus in a free-roaming urban environment much like Grand Theft Auto would do decades later. Your goal in the game is to stop a gang of drug smugglers from delivering heroin <laughs> by chasing their cars and destroying them. Whoa. Either with a machine gun that's mounted on your car, naturally, or by ramming them. It was just one example of a type of driving game that wouldn't work at the arcade, but was possible on a home system. Because we all know how good a Lotus would be at ramming other cars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd probably just break down before you could hit another car, actually. <laughs> yeah. By the end of the 80s, the arcade's golden era was drawing to a close. The main factor was economics. Sales for cabinets were typically measured in tens of thousands, with each one needing constant maintenance and a steady stream of customers to remain profitable. Additionally, every year, computer hardware got cheaper and smaller, meaning large arcade cabinets were no longer necessary to house games. In 1985, the Nintendo Entertainment System was released to an eager American and European audience, and by 1991, it had sold 30 million units in the United States alone. The customer had spoken. Arcades, on the other hand, entered a long decline as they struggled to bring in gamers. For their part, console and PC gaming companies worked tirelessly to entice customers to invest in their consoles and games. Although niche, innovative games like Turbo Esprit were exciting signs of gaming's future potential to draw in massive audiences. The NES and other home consoles focused on creating ports, meaning copies or clones of the arcade games people were familiar with. In 1987, for example, a little-known Japanese software company known as Square would release Rad Racer, a game that was essentially a home version of OutRun. Is that Square Enix? Is that would like... become Square Enix, yeah. Oh, Square okay. and Enix were two separate studios, and then they came together to form Square Enix, 
Like OutRun, in Rad Racer, you drove a Ferrari. In this case, a twin turbo 328. Although you had the added option of a Formula One car. <laughs> Ooh. Locations included Los Angeles, San Francisco, and the Parthenon. Oh, hell there yeah. was an in and there is an you know, those three places. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and there was an in-game radio you could use to pick music. The advantage of an arcade game like OutRun was that the hardware could be fully dedicated to running that single game. So Rad Racer, which had to run on the 8-bit NES, had notably inferior graphics to its arcade predecessor. To compensate, the developers threw in some gimmicks, including a 3D mode that would allow players to add a dimension to the game by wearing stereoscopic glasses. Very cool. And if you were lucky enough to own an NES Power Glove, you could play the game with that too. What's more delightfully 80s than plastic accessories? Typically, games of the time would employ one programmer, but Square's president, Masafumi Miyamoto, added a second programmer to the team, Nasir Gabelli, to handle the 3D visuals, which had a pleasing vaporware feel to them. In addition to Rad Racer, Square also released a little game called Final Fantasy, which is maybe why Rad Racer, uh, it's what the boys mentioned earlier, is a footnote in the company's history, despite selling half a million copies. Yeah, th I mean, these graphics are Vaporwave AF. <laughs> you, you got that Lotus and then the, a nice skyline in the distance. Looks very cool. And it's uh, when you get to select your car, there's the 328 twin turbo, and then there's just the F1 machine. <laughs> 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 with gamers hooked developers were free to explore increasingly realistic games that wouldn't work in an arcade setting where the priority was to keep games short and the quarters flowing mm -hmm. a prime example of one such title is 1989's ms dos game indianapolis 500 the simulator which recreates from a first person perspective the complete experience of driving in a full length 200 God. lap Indy 500 race with a 33 car field. It was the first true racing simulator, a genre that we'll explore in, in much greater depth uh, later on. Can't wait. I love those Sims, baby. I'm a big time Sim nerd. He's a Sim boy. Big time Sim boy. Sim Simp. In Indianapolis 500, the simulation, you were given the choice between three cars, a yellow Penske Chevy, a red Lola Buick, or a blue March Cosworth. All 32 computer cars you were driving against could experience mechanical failures or crash. And the game included yellow flags, which stopped you from being able to pass. Oh, yeah, caution. That's cool. That is cool. Your computer competitors bore the names of real IndyCar drivers of the time, including Andretti, Al Unser, and Filipaldi, among many others. The game, published by Electronic Arts, sold 200,000 units clearly establishing a demand for sim-type racing games that were so polar opposite of the typical arcade experience. Winning the game required extensive knowledge of IndyCar, including how to properly tune and pit your car. YouTube user Blitprog posted a video of a victory he achieved. It's a grueling two and a half hours long. Programmer David Kamer would later follow up on the success of Indianapolis 500 with a sequel, 1993's IndyCar Racing, which actually allowed for head-to-head -head racing by connecting two computers via modem cable. That's cool. Wow. LAN party. <laughs> As gaming entered the 90s, racing games became increasingly mainstream, and companies looked to cash in. Days of Thunder was a prime example. Loosely based on the Tom Cruise movie of the same year, it was clearly banking on the NASCAR film's huge popularity and was released for Amiga, Atari, Commodore 64, PC, NES, and Game Boy, among others. A true multi-platform game. Very cool. And it, it had to do with uh, this family of like undercover cops <laughs> called the Durrits. <laughs> Another licensed game was Ayrton Senna's Super Monaco GP2, which we briefly mentioned in our previous series on Senna. The game was a product of the relationship between... Don't say it. Sega. There you go. Which by 1992 was a gaming monolith and Formula One. This included the sponsorship of the 1993 F1 European Grand Prix, also known as the Sega European Grand Prix, which featured Senna hoisting a Sonic the Hedgehog trophy. Coolest trophy ever. At that Sega European Grand Prix, the festivities of that race were a parade of men <laughs> wearing horrific Sonic skin suits. <laughs> This picture is so funny. Yeah, let's let's get that on screen for sure, Bridget. Oh my god. 
Oh my god, dude. <laughs> um, that's hilarious, dude. Oh my god. That is hilarious. Um, yeah, anyway, and Damon Hill, he was in a promo video where he appears to be held hostage by Sonic as he whips out a game gear and pretends to play it. Wait, uh, that's not like part of Sonic's thing. He doesn't like kidnap people. Uh -oh. Yeah, if anything, Shadow the Hedgehog would kidnap someone, but never oh, Sonic. Oh, Shadow, dude. Yeah, Shadow didn't come out until um, a lot later, I think. But uh, yeah, Shadow is edgy, dude. Shadow listens to My <laughs> Chemical Romance. He yeah. wears Doc Martens. <laughs> yeah. he, um, he's really into Joy Division, you know? Updates his live journal every single day. <laughs> <laughs> um. As far as Super Monaco GP2 goes, it's notable in that Senna took the name endorsement very seriously. He actually consulted on the design of the game, including a visit to Sega headquarters in Japan, where he recorded voiceover advice to be included in the game for each track, which is pretty awesome. Apparently, he hadn't raced at the Circuit de Catalunya, the new course for the Spanish GP, and thus refused to record his audio for that track until he'd done so. <laughs> wow. That's cool, man. Yeah. Nolan and I recorded tips uh, for a bunch of stuff we've never done Yeah, in the new Dirt 5 game. We're like, hey, here's how you drive on a frozen lake. <laughs> it is pretty funny. Um, I can't, yeah. Dude, I can't wait to play that. If, if it feels like video games were getting to be really big business, that's because they were. By the 90s, gaming was no longer a nerdy hobby. It was a massive multi-billion dollar industry, and racing games were a big slice of that gaming pie. However... Everything we've covered in the world of racing games was about to be dwarfed by Nintendo stepping into the arena and developing its own original titles for its own brand new 16-bit Super Nintendo Ooh. Entertainment System. Yeah, Super Nintendo. Among the SNES's launch titles was F-Zero, a futuristic game set in 2560 when, as the game's backstories <laughs> established, a supercharged 900 kilometer per hour hover car version of F1 called appropriately F0 is now popular across the galaxy. This is one of my favorite racing games, even though it's not like mm -hmm. a real car. It's so fun. The designers had been inspired by Tim Burton's 1989 Batman film, which featured a sleek and muscular Batmobile that would fit right in in 2560. The game's hover car racing in the clouds concept actually sprang from hardware limitations, proof that limits on creativity can often paradoxically encourage it to blossom. Something I believe 100%. Firstly, showing tires spinning and kicking up dust would take up too much of the Super Nintendo's memory, so the designers had the idea to remove the tires altogether. Instead, the cars would float. They called them hover cars. Secondly, the technical design of the game dictated that the map you raced on was actually one massive flat video game sprite, allowing no obstacles like trees or rocks. So the fix was to move the race to a place without trees or rocks, up in the clouds where a flat track made perfect sense. Like the Batman movie that inspired it, F-Zero was a massive critical and commercial hit for Nintendo, with gamers praising its tight controls and hectic sense of speed. However, F-Zero and all previous racing games before it were dwarfed by the arrival of a certain plumber of Japanese and Italian origins. It's actually kind of fascinating that these two huge car nations also produced the king of virtual racing. And of course, we're talking about Mario, dressed as always in Ferrari Red and his massive hit game, Super Mario Kart. Mario Kart was released in 1992 for the Super Nintendo. It was created by Shigeru Miyamoto, the legendary designer of the original Super Mario Brothers, and incorporated many characters from the Mario franchise. The iconic box art shows a colorfully chaotic race in full swing with Mario, Peach, Bowser, and Donkey Kong racing shoulder to shoulder, and the tagline, where racing becomes an adventure. Man, uh, this is one of the first games that I ever played. On SNES? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Did you do the little hop uh, hack? No. What are you talking about? You can drift around corners if you bounce, and you can cut corners like way quicker. I played against someone who like mastered it, and it wasn't fun at all. <laughs> They're just like beating me by like a minute every time. I don't, yeah, I don't think I was good enough as a child to play. Uh, I didn't have a console until I was like, seven or eight years old. 
Poor oh, guy. Poor baby. Oh. oh, Bergie had one when he was four. Bergie had like all the consoles. That's why he's a chemist. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like my mom, she would go to the gym and the gym had like a daycare nice. center on nice. it. Nice. And they had a Super Nintendo. This was like the second game I ever nice. played. The first game I ever played was called Radical Rex. And it was a Sonic ripoff about a, a, a T-Rex that rode a skateboard. <laughs> Oh, that is that radical. sounds really fun. That sounds like right up my alley. Oh, yeah. You'd probably love it, dude. Anyway, Mario Kart, as you probably know, allowed players to race along tracks filled with coins, shells, and bananas. There was also a battle mode where players used bananas and shells to attack each other's carts. Attack each other's carts, excuse me. Interestingly enough, though, it didn't start out as a Mario title. Nintendo was simply developing a generic kart racer, but a few months into development, a curious programmer decided to test out what would it look like if Mario was driving. And of course he looked amazing. So cute. Don't even get me started on Toad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's go around and say what what your go-to character in Mario Kart is. No one. Yoshi. James. Toad if I want to be someone else. Donkey Kong if I just want to be myself. <laughs> <laughs> I am also a Yoshi head. Hell yeah. I think he's the most balanced driver out there. Well, his drifting skill is really good in, in the later titles anyway. Uh, the developers led by Miyamoto quickly realized the appeal and they ran with it. They ran with it, excuse me, resulting in a game that in classic Nintendo style was not just for driving enthusiasts or hardcore gamers, but the whole family. It spawned an entire genre of kart racing games, including Sonic Drift, Diddy Kong Racing, which is pretty fun, South Park Rally, also remember that one, and the greatest of them all, Garfield Kart, <laughs> which allows you to compete against John and Odie and I assume Nermal for a chance to hoist the iconic lasagna, pizza, and hamburger cups. How original. It's on Steam, too. Oh, my God. Garfield Kart what? didn't come out <laughs> until 2013. Wow. <laughs> it looks kind of fun, though. It looks really hectic. I... Okay, that farm track looks exactly like the one in Mario Kart. Um, they probably just bought it. It's five bucks. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna buy this, guys. I'm gonna play it, and I'll we should stream oh you playing God. it. Yeah, I'll I'll um report back on Garfield Kart in next episode and let you know what you the deal is. You should stream it on the um, Donut Underground Discord. I can do that. It only needs 250 megabytes of available space, so this should download <laughs> in like a minute. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Mario Kart would go on to become the 13th best-selling video game franchise of all time with 152 million units in sales across 30 years and eight main titles. Ooh. That also makes it the best-selling racing game of all time with Need for Speed a close second with 150 million in sales. Wow. In a distant third comes Gran Turismo with a seriously embarrassing <laughs> 80 million. I thought Gran Turismo <clears throat> would be more than Need for Speed. Uh, I think the like the point of entry for Need for Speed is a lot smaller. Yeah, yeah Gran Turismo is still arcade style, but it's more simmy. Like Need for Speed has uh like a storyline yeah. and stuff. Also, Need for Speed is multi-platform. Very importantly, mm, very importantly, I'm a, I'm an idiot for not mentioning. It's great for it. me with my Panasonic 3DO system. <laughs> <laughs> With Mario Kart, arcades had lost not just the battle, but the war. They had already lost ground to PC and console gamers in terms of realism. I mean, you can't race an indie car at an arcade for two and a half hours unless you spend like a million quarters. But now they were losing in terms of fun. Why go to the arcade when you and your friends could play Mario Kart for hours on end and your mom could make you Totino's pizza rolls in the comfort of your freaking unfinished basement? <laughs> However, despite the demise of the arcade, the potential for racing video games was only barely being tapped into. While games like Indianapolis 500 could claim to be realistic, actual photorealism was still far out of reach. Games of the 80s and 90s could at best achieve a cartoon approximation of real life, with sprites merely acting as symbols of the real thing. All of that was about to change, with the release of those other massive franchises we mentioned. Need for Speed. And most importantly, Gran Turismo. 
as gaming would take a massive leap forward in the latter part of the 90s. Increasingly, the line would be blurred between the virtual and the real. Who knows? One day, it might just disappear altogether. And that's next week on Pass Gas. Woo! You! That was a fun now, one. I'm so yeah. stoked. I love racing. I love games. And you know what? When they come together, yeah. there's nothing better. I've been preparing for this episode my entire life. Seriously. Yeah. I think like once PlayStation shows up, that's when we started playing yep, yep, games. Yep. This stuff is like, like, I remember playing Super Nintendo, but I think I was still like too young to really grasp what a video game yeah. was uh but once like the playstation generation of stuff oh yeah came out that's when i was like head down straight up hours yeah homework brushed aside yeah yep. uh, <laughs> why is james doing so poorly in school now <laughs> yeah but for me i'm i'm really looking forward to talking about like that playstation 2 era xbox era of racing games like for me that was like such a I, important time is I think putting a little too much weight on it, but I like mean, for you is important. It, yeah, I mean it was just like a a very nostalgic time, you know. So many of those games. Oh, are you talking about your childhood? Oh yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, the time between like five and eighteen, <laughs> such a nostalgic time. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I look back on those thirteen years with fondness. Yeah, <laughs> I do. It's that strange. half of my life. Um, <laughs> Uh, so yeah thank you so much for listening guys thank you so much for watching if you're watching on YouTube uh, this has been Past Gas by Donut Media um, follow all the hosts at Joe G. Weber at James Pumphrey at Nolan Sykes you know what it is at Donut Media big thank you to Bridget for uh, directing and producing be kind keep it juiced and from everyone here at Donut Podcast chill till the next episode <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> good, right? Yeah, really, good. <laughs> really good. All right. I love you guys. I'll see you next week. Yeah. See you next time.